Good evening. This is Brett Provenzano. I am the proud superintendent of the Fairport Central School District. I am here at Fairport High School with um, um, our administrative team who has been working very close with our return to school um, full-time pr um, pr um, imperative that we've been working with our advisory committees on over the past several weeks. The purpose of this session is to share our current state and develop the common themes we learn from the advisory committee. The information that I will be sharing tonight um, is synthesized from the great work of the 70 members or close to 70 members who participated in our process. We hope to confirm our next steps and certainly address any questions um, that are coming forth through the um, question and answer form that we ask you to submit. Um, that's gonna be the crux of what um, the meeting will be about. We hope to end promptly by um, six, or excuse me, 7.45, um, an hour and 15 minutes to do this. Um, again, if we do not get to all the questions, we will certainly be answering them in our Q&A updates as we continue to move through this process. Again, I have to express my great heartfelt appreciation. Um, there were many individuals, over 200 community members expressed an interest to be a part of our advisory committee. It was really challenging, um, but you know, using a process and a rubric, um, we felt like we had a balanced team um, that provided incredible feedback and, um, and, and uh, recommendations for us to consider. Um, our facilitators included in the K-5, um, Kristen Larson and Ellen Reed. Um, Kristen is our director of um, STEAM and um, Ellen Reed is our director of humanities. And you'll see on the screen the number of participants and the names of the participants. Once again, thank you for our K-5 participants. Our 6-8 was led by our student services director, Deborah Miles, and our director of professional learning, Kevin Henschen. And again, um, the cast um, of individuals who provided unique insights into the 6-8 transition. And again, these conversations were extremely focused. Walking into all of them, I was so impressed with the level of investment and the care that everybody was putting forth to, for this contribution. Um, we have our 912th group that was led by Bob Clark, um, who is the principal of Fairport High School, and Doug Loff, who is the assistant superintendent for human resources. And once again, to our Stakeholders involved in the 912th group, again, focused conversations, making sure that they're addressing um, the things that are going really well and concerns and um, some thoughts on how to transition back in the safest way possible. So again, heartfelt appreciation. I know our Board of Education appreciates the investment and the time that was put into these sessions. It's important to recognize that on March 19th, the CDC shifted distancing guidelines from six feet to three feet. That was very important because as many of you know, that one piece was the part that was keeping us out of our schools because of the size of our schools. Distancing was certainly or is certainly an issue. However, the CDC shifted the guidance. Public Health Commissioner Dr. Mendoza, County Executive Adam Bellow support distancing changes. They even sent letters to the Department of Health and to Governor Cuomo. Um, and they were specifically speaking on the importance of coming back to school. And the new CDC guidance recommends distancing modifications be in place for all elementary, middle, and high schools where community transmission is low, moderate, or substantial. And in elementary schools where community transmission is high. In middle and high schools, where community transmission is high and cohorting is not possible, the recommendation remains at six feet of physical distance, again, if cohorting is not possible. Um, we have always said that we are waiting for the New York State Department of Health to provide the guidance and support, um, but to date, we have heard nothing from the New York State Department of Health. Um, and over the pa past couple days, I know many of you have heard that um, our county officials um, have stated the importance of getting their support for any approval to return to full-time school. Again, um, there's lots of things happening in, in the state level, and I 
don't need to go through those details, but it's definitely impacting um, what we're trying to accomplish. Um, however, we are continuing forward. Again, if you take a look at the CDC guidance, in, at the elementary school level, in the low and moderate transmission areas, physical distancing, at least three feet between students in classrooms, we can do that. Right? We could do less than six feet and greater than three feet. We are working with our district architects um, to get a schematic of each room and its layout. Um, there might be some tight spots, but I know our principals, and they could speak to this, will be adjusting accordingly if there are tight spaces. Um, if you go to substantial transmission or the orange zone, elementary physical distancing, at least three feet of distance between students and classrooms. You could still come to school, even in the orange and red zones, if you're an elementary student, and I'm calling elementary kindergarten through sixth grade, intentionally putting our sixth graders into it, because we can cohort at this level as defined by the CDC guidance. If we get to our secondary, our middle schools and high schools, physical distancing, distancing at least three feet between students in classrooms. This could be done less than six feet and again, greater than three feet. We are marking out each classroom. Each classroom has different variables to consider. Um, administrators realize that if there are tight spots, they are committed to accommodating different spaces to meet these requirements. In the orange and red transmission rates for middle and high school, this is important. Physical distancing, at least three feet of distance between students and classrooms. Cohort recommended when possible. And again, I just want to highlight the words when possible, right? And it's when possible even up here in the elementary schools. That ambiguity, um, you know, causes different groups to have different um, interpretations of what that means. But we believe in or with our contact tracing efforts, we are able to understand where kids are throughout the day. Through our master scheduling, we know where students are every single period of the day. So if there is an infection, we can monitor that, we can contact trace it, and we can mitigate relative to um, the best practices for each potential situation. Um, I think, again, it's worth mentioning, we believe that it's important to get back to schools for all the reasons why. Our students um, are benefit most from our schools when they're here. Their social interactions, um, the academic pieces are incredibly important, but we also know that students depend on us for technology. They depend on us for nutrition. They um, per, um, depend on us to make sure that we can provide a safe and healthy environment so they can flourish and be the best person they can be. We are at our best when we are interacting with our students directly. They are at their best when they can experience the, um, our schools at their fullest. Again, um, the CDC guidance and the transmission rates um, are important to consider, but elementary, um, there's clarity relative to the CDC guidance, and we have a proposal through our contact tracing and our master scheduling to be able to support our students no matter what our transmission rate is. Again, everything that I'm about to share um, was reinforced or mentioned or resonated through our advisory. Um, again, vaccination, there's access now to vaccination. That wasn't the case in November or December. Um, we have dedicated links um, for um, transportation workers, our cafeteria workers. Um, I know our staff has had access, um, and that's a good thing because the vaccine does what it's supposed to do. It moves individuals who get COVID, because it's not just going to go away, but it, um, it, it, it protects individuals. Um, it keeps our hospitals um, at a functioning rate. It, um, same thing for our ICUs. Um, anything that we do, we will come back as masked. Masking will always be a part of this school year. 
Um, COVID-19 in-house testing, I just secured 2,500 um, tests, COVID tests, the same tests that we used this past year um, for our testing program. Um, that will help us get through the year. We would start testing to provide that assurances that our schools are safe, that our students are safe. And if, again, contact tracing is such an important part. I'm proud of our efforts. We have a wonderful relationship with the county when situations do occur. Um, they're great partners in helping us mitigate each circumstance. And again, if you take a look, and I'm, I'm being redundant, you know, we have sports going on right now, and that's a good thing. We want to see our kids actively engaged. They're together, right? They're coming from different parts of their day, but they're together, and they're interacting. It, then tomorrow, they're coming back into our schools and interacting. Easily traced if there is ever an infection um, because of our process. And that's a credit to um, Deborah Miles and our administrative team. Deborah Miles is our director of student services. And of course, our administrators help with that process. We are planning to resubmit our return to school plans to the New York State Education Department um, by April 5th. So our work continues. We have high expectations about moving forward and bringing students in person learning and virtual learning five days per week on Monday, April 19th. Now, it's hard. I also know some of the things that we may be proposing seems counterintuitive. Um, why would we start the year all over again in April? Um, there's going to be some shifts in programming, and that's something no one ever wants to do. We know that in-person learning five days a week it's just not going to happen. Um, our students, our staff, they need to transition. For our online families, they will be going and receiving online learning five days a week. K-5, there will be classroom assignments and teacher changes, which we will be talking about. And again, it's not something that we would normally do, but we are in unusual circumstances. And our goal is to get our students back they need to experience school in its fullest form. Our 6th through 12th graders will be meeting synchronously every single day. That's lots of screen time, right? So those are things that we're challenging. And this isn't a challenging endeavor for our instructors when we embed virtual students into the classroom because we have a number of students in front of us and we have a handful of students behind us. And trying to manage both of them, that's, that is, again, um, really proud of the efforts, um, a model that we're going to continue, though, to, to assess moving forward. But we're going to continue it for the rest of this year. And we're going to continue the K-5 virtual for the rest of this year. We believe the benefits of returning outweigh the detrimental effects of staying out. Again, um, more than ever, sadly, um, there's been um, accounts where students are just not showing up. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that, that gets at our core because we try to meet every student where they are. We see academic struggles. We see social emotional struggles. We see, um, again, students who depend on us for nutrition. There's many food insecurities, technology inconsistencies. We all take for granted that every single student has access to robust technology at home. That's not the case. Again, it impacts um, the environment um, and the, the equity components that are very important to us as a public school. As we transition back, we will need to continue to be flexible, patient, and always focus on the bigger picture. Um, I'm not promising that this is going to be perfect or seamless, but we do know that our priority is to ease students back to school and to build stamina. A lot of students haven't been to school for consecutive days. In fact, our um, Tuesday, Friday cohorts just finished um, two consecutive days on a Tuesday, Wednesday rotation. Um, and I, I know that because I have children in the Tuesday, Friday cohort. Um, they need to be eased back in. Um, that continues to be um, a theme that was even shared through our advisory. Addressing the social, emotional, and academic needs of our students. Um, and again, I am going to always say social, emotional needs need to be addressed first. If Students do not feel comfortable if they do not feel safe. Um, our environment um, is the most important thing because it will produce 
the learning that needs to occur. And as we transition back, what are the intentional things that we're going to do to make sure that we're meeting those needs? Our ultimate goal is to be prepared and well-informed in the fall. If we do this right and thoughtfully, um, we won't have to go through the ebbs and flows of this. Our students will seamlessly transition back. We will have a productive summer program and orientations as well. Planning is critical. Teacher planning days are needed, which I'll be talking about in a moment, which will mean that we're going to be adding some student asynchronous days. We will need to hire additional staff to fulfill teaching needs for our online learners. We need teacher aides and teacher assistants to support our buildings for the range of needs and supervision, supervision that we need to run our schools appropriately. We're starting this now because it takes time to do all those things. But before you know it, April 19th will be here. And I just saw a bunch of smiles. Again, our priorities. Thank you to our advisory committee um, for providing clarity and re reassurance that we're on the right path. We really want to nurture the social emotional well-being of our students. And it's about acclimating our students and staff back to a sense of normalcy. This is about prioritizing their well-being, critical habits of mind to, again, persevere, show grit and resilience, and really give students an opportunity to come in and talk about their experiences. They need to learn their routines. They need to get back into school shape so they can build the stamina. This is not a race to accelerate the curriculum or to fill learning gaps. Learning is important, but if we take care of the first bullet, the social emotional components, in prioritizing, acclimating our students and staff back to the normal, the academic pieces will fall into place. We are not going to be trying to make up a year's worth of work in 10 weeks. More is not better. Grading will not be punitive. We will give students every opportunity to be successful, just like we have been doing all year long. Our teachers' flexibility and expansive mindset um, and our administrators and, and our professionals who try to support our students, um, they're, re they're relentless. And I'm proud to serve with all of them. But those standards will continue to apply as we transition students back. Um, there needs to be purposeful assignments and assessments so we can be informed and understand where students are academically so we're ready for them in the fall. So if we need to adjust our pacing guides, we can adjust our pacing guides. Um, it takes time and planning to do that. That's what we want to use this time for so we can hit the ground running once again. <clears throat> Here is a timeline. Again, this timeline has been communicated multiple different times. Um, we've been working through this week. We've had a voluntary staff meeting this afternoon with um, our staff sharing the similar information. Last night, I don't mean to go back, I apologize, uh, our Board of Education had, um, you know, an incredibly um, hearty and, and, and meaningful conversation with uh, the same team that's sitting here tonight. Thank you very much for being with us here tonight. I know that this is um, important to you. That's why you're here. But I appreciate your sacrifice, and I know the board does as well. But it was a, a robust conversation, um, um, and that is on our YouTube live channel. So please don't hesitate to check that out as well um, as, as you're trying to inform yourself. Um, here we are this evening, and tomorrow we will be sending out a final survey to parents to confirm placements and our transportation needs. Um, at this point, we're going to need to finalize and make decisions. Okay, and we'll be going through what that looks like moving forward. Um, if you do not respond to the survey, we will just assume that your current placement that you've um, chosen is, is standing. For your planning purposes, this is important. Asynchronous learning day will occur for students and a planning day for staff on Friday, April 16th. The purpose of this day is to focus on our physical spaces and plan for the first day of school with combined cohorts. Um, and, and again, it takes intentional planning. We'll be coming back um, 
with, with spacing requirements, we want to make sure that our environments are right to bring in our students. On the 19th, we plan for a K-12 return to full-time in-person and virtual learning. On the 21st and 28th, again, in the name of being thoughtful, in the name of assessing how the first days of school are going, the last two Wednesdays will be asynchronous learning days for students and planning days for staff. Students will have an opportunity to do asynchronous work. Our staff will assess how things are going, make adjustments, plan. And as we're doing this, hopefully the students will eventually transition and have the stamina moving forward to complete the year. Again, we will continue to keep these dates to the forefront. Um, and it's important for planning, purpose that, planning purposes that you are aware that they are here. I think the most important part of this evening, after I established the foundations here, is to get to the questions and answers. And I am going to call up our Director of Professional Learning, Mr. Kevin Henschen. He will be the moderator. We're, we're trying to monitor the, the Google Forms that you're completing. Um, we already have some questions ready. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, so we're going to start off, and you're going to be hearing from different administrators, so you're just not hearing from me. I, I think um, their depth and expertise is reassuring, and it definitely speaks to their commitment to this, this process. Mr. Henschen. Good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you to everybody out there, uh, parents and community members, for taking the time this evening um, to be here with us. Um, I also want to thank all of our educators and anybody throughout the day that touches the lives of our most precious commodity, and that's our students, and why we're here this evening. Um, in addition to Brett and the board, and finally, last but not least, every administrator in this district who is the glue behind what is happening and helping with all of the details to make this a reality for our students. So thank you. This evening, what we are going to accomplish or try to do is to answer questions that Brett said have come through the Google Forms. We looked at them and tried to, to find some themes and put them together under some specific categories. And we have various administrators here this evening to help answer those questions. So Brett shared with us a little bit earlier the why we're going to bring students back, even 10, 11 weeks before the end of the school year. So we've already established that particular um, baseline. But what we heard in the message was, do no harm to our students. Make them feel welcome. Make them feel safe. Let's, let's deal with their, their social, emotional well-being. And my question is, one of them that came in is, you know, how will the district specifically um, prioritize the emotional well-being of students when they return? And what will that look like? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, this is Deb Miles, the Director of Student Services. So I'll start out just by sharing. I mean, I think we've heard very clearly from our superintendent that uh, the health and wellness of our students is a top priority as we transition back to school. Um, one of the things we think about first and foremost is just building up that stamina to return to a five-day week of full learning. Um, so I, we will certainly be communicating with our families, you know, from our schools, from our district, in terms of what are some things that you can be doing at home to start to reestablish those back-to-school routines. You know, we know that when kids have, you know, days off in between or maybe even a day and a half where they're not, you know, getting up and attending school, bedtimes get a little bit later, more activities creep into the day, lots of... Uh, you know, video games and things. So really just trying to reestablish some of those um, at-home routines that will help the students be much more alert and, and make it through their school day. Um, in terms of, you know, what types of strategies that we will be doing during the school day to support kids, we have um, foundationally built into our programs a number of strategies to support their emotional well-being, such as reinforcing their emotional regulation, uh, mindful uh, minutes, community meetings, you know, in the classroom, check-ins with students by the adults, um, reinforcing self-care, you know, thinking about our pacing and giving kids natural breaks where it's appropriate. Um, students that require a little bit more than that can certainly be referred to 
our um, school psychologists, social workers, and counselors for additional support as well. And if parents have concerns as you transition your students back, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to your building administrators and ask for help. Great, thanks Deb, appreciate that. We know that students have been um, following a very different model for their education up until now. In, in many cases, I'm sure parents and family members at home can attest to the fact that students are able to complete assignments hopefully and have their evenings free currently and their, their weekends. And so it has created a different sort of a, of a mindset. And now that we're transitioning back into school, um, I know that the question is on minds as it was for many parents here about what the district's plan is um, at the various grade bands um, to address not only the curriculum, but the homework, any extended assignments, testing from the point that they return till the end of the school year. I can start that one off. This is Meredith Kuz, principal at Brooks Hill, and I'll speak on behalf of the elementary group. So um, in addition to the things that Deb just mentioned about some of the social emotional uh, things that we'll do right in the classroom, such as community building, uh, the exciting part is that for many of our classes, these cohorts were together at one point on the virtual Wednesdays, and we'll have the opportunity to now be back in person together in person, which uh, many elementary students are looking forward to if you talk to them. So there's a lot of opportunity to build into the day some of those things that Deb was just talking about. And we want to be cautious about not overloading, like the superintendent said earlier, the curriculum needs. So when it comes to finding the balance, we will certainly be continuing the pacing that we've been doing. We're not hurrying that up and adding more to what we're expecting students to be doing during the day. We're gonna make sure that we're doing it at a pace that they can handle with five days a week and to a depth that allows them a little bit more understanding than, than they're able to gather in such a quick paced uh, week now. And in terms of the homework specifically, Kevin, you bring that up. We at K-5 really believe that much like the beginning of a normal year in September would occur, it would be a slow roll into a, you know about a six or eight week period before you'd start to see a real increase in responsibilities in the evening. So we're anticipating no real uh, depth of homework in the evening. We want kids to focus on the day, get back into the routines, make those connections with their teachers, and have that be the focus. What we can see continuing, which is always good for kids, is an emphasis on reading with your child, you know, continuing to practice some of those uh, you know, sight words or math facts or some of the things that we naturally do with our kids at home on a regular basis. So there'll be some of that, but nothing too extreme because we want to focus on the social emotional aspects and the curriculum during the day. I'll pass it off to uh, the middle school to perhaps add there. Thanks, Meredith. Uh, well said. I'm Dave Dunn, Principal Martha Brown and Pat Grove, Principal Joanna Perrin. We're talking about this, uh, this topic right here a lot. Uh, about a, a year and a week ago, our teachers, of course, were dealing with uh, trying to read the room, and the room was empty, and the faces were on the screens for the last 15 weeks of last year. And it was difficult for them to actually read the room because some of the kids weren't having their cameras on, so it was really difficult for the teachers to kind of get a feel for each of the students in their class. I'm thankful that the, uh, the district plan has some uh, days for the students to actually get ready for uh, the first day, that, that, that synchronous day on Friday before, as well as the, the two consecutive Wednesdays, because it's gonna give them an opportunity to really read the room this time, because they're bringing both cohorts back together. They've never done that after this about 30 weeks. It'll be a, kind of a new class configuration for them, as well as they're all virtual students as well. So I think that they're gonna use those first two Wednesday planning days very, very carefully to make sure that they've got the, got the read for the room, uh, the message from us is this is not the time to make up 70 years of U.S. history. We're, we're, not, we're not looking at doing that. We're looking at uh, more, maybe more focusing on skill building these last eight weeks, knowing that, uh, you know, the months of May and June uh, bring their own, their own uh, issues to schools when it gets hot and towards the end of the year. So our teachers are really going to be balancing the opportunity to, to connect with their kids as well as work on building some of those skill gaps 
And in terms of the content gaps, you know, we dealt with that last, last year. Uh, our teachers do a lot of talking amongst uh, themselves as well as the grade level above. So it was pretty clear what content didn't get covered as we started school the school year in the fall. Our directors certainly had played a large role in that as well. And we anticipate having to do that again this year because we know we're not going to get the entire year content covered. But again, our teachers are, are pros at, at kind of reading the room and kind of feeling exactly how much they can do without compromising the, uh, the emotional and social needs of our students. So the strong message, at least at the middle school, is going to be more is not better. We're not looking to pile on homework. We're really looking to be recognizing the fact that these kids are now here five days a week, and they're going to perhaps get, get work maybe, maybe up those five days, and we want to make sure that the amount of work that they have is somewhat uh, reasonable for them to accomplish. Uh, what do we got here from the high school? Uh, Dom and Bob? Yeah, Dominic Monticelli here, Principal of Minerva Delan. I would echo what I've already heard already with the, the philosophy of the, the ninth grade in the 912 high school. I would say it's important for parents to know that majority of our staff have chil you know, children of their own that are school-aged. So we all understand this is going to be a, a challenging change of pace, uh, the challenges that this is going to bring, and we'll approach that with that, that in mind, that we're going to be supportive, empathetic, as we all learn this new rhythm of this new environment. Um, in, in addition to that, with the high school, obviously, it's a little bit different as far as credit bearing courses and regents exams. There's continuous changes with the regents exams. I don't want to get too far in the nuances, but you know, there's some have been canceled. Some are still there, but the state is, is changing weekly with how much um, they're going to require of students for those exams. So right now we're preparing for those, but we're not going to. That's not our number one focus, as I said. We'll communicate changes as they come. Our number one focus is the well-being of our children, and our staff will do a great job of that. Uh, Bob Clark here for the high school, and um, I'll just add just a little bit of nuance to, to the 10-12 um, grade level. Um, again, as uh, all of the administrators, administrators have talked about, uh, the focus is going to be on the depth of learning and not the breadth of learning. Um, we have the opportunity to go a little deeper and make sure that um, our kids understand where things are at. We still have some decisions to make on a local level on um, how teachers want to end the year for the areas where exams have been canceled. Um, there definitely is a little bit of a nuance in the sense that um, all of our AP courses are still ending in an assessment. And so many of those teachers have been teaching synchronously throughout the year to make sure that their um, content, um, that, that they deliver the right amount of content for those assessments. Um, just, a, just a point of emphasis. Um, even though students will be returning to class two and a half times more than they typically are, um, it doesn't infer that there'll be more work. In, in fact, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, you know, much of the work that they have to do independently when they are assigned asynchronous work, um, there's a lot, there has been pressure up until this point by teachers, again, to deliver that content so students are learning independently. With five days of instruction, the teachers have an opportunity to deliver that in a guided way and there should be less emphasis on independent work and more emphasis on facilitating learning in the classroom. And again, um, giving our teachers the opportunity to build culture, um, to really truly get to know their students and to bring the cohorts together is, is an exciting opportunity for us. So we do not anticipate doubling the work. If anything, we're gonna go deeper and we're gonna take longer to make sure that our kids know where, where, you know, where they need to be. Great, thank you so much, everybody. We're now going to shift the conversation to virtual instruction. And this next question um, really, I believe, is concentrated more to our K through 5 uh, buildings. But the, uh, the 6 through 12 buildings, you're, you're also welcome at some point to um, sort of just kind of uh, concretize and, and help us understand what's going to be doing moving forward. But there was a lot of energy around this and a lot of, a lot of people asking this question. So, the question is, how did the district decide to move virtual teachers to in-person and create long-term substitutes for virtual learners? Thanks, Kevin. This is Erin Ryder, the principal at Northside School, and I'll attempt to, to tackle this question tonight because I know it is a, certainly a, a challenging topic, probably the most challenging issue we are dealing with at the elementary level. There's a lot of passion around it, and we absolutely understand that. Our virtual teachers have done an incredible job building community and making classroom magic happen over a screen. And we know it's hard that we could be discussing a, a teacher change, especially at this point in the school year. First and foremost, the district wants to honor the commitment 
um, that parents um, have made their choice in the beginning of the school year for virtual instruction, and the district will honor the commitment to provide virtual instruction through the end of the school year. How we came to this decision was really based on the initial data um, that we received from parents district-wide and across all four of our elementary buildings that supported the idea that many parents of virtual students would be interested in having their child return to in-person learning five days a week. And students who are fully virtual right now will have the option, if they come into the building five days a week, of essentially following their current teacher into the school building and remaining with their teacher. However, this then creates the need to hire new teachers for the students that um, will remain virtual. And we are committed to providing resources, including our technology coaches, our instructional coaches, our lead teachers, working in partnership with the current virtual teachers to make the transition um, to a new teacher as seamless as possible. Ultimately, um, the superintendent spoke of the final decision survey that is gonna be sent out to parents and is due back on April 7th. And the data from that survey will ultimately guide our planning of the fully virtual sections as we determine how many sections are gonna be needed um, across the four elementary buildings. Um, we really need to strike a balance between class sizes and staffing for both in-person and our virtual learners. And I'm gonna turn it over to Pat to address the middle school. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, yeah, Pat Grove from JP here. Um, our schedulers have done a really good job since the start of the year trying to schedule uh, students both virtual and in person in hopes of coming back. So we are not gonna be changing our virtual model and how that instruction is delivered right now. So those students will be able to stay with the same teachers in the same modality they have been since the start of the year. Uh, obviously with the exception of being five days a week. Yeah, I would echo uh, what Mr. Groh just said. It's the only change is the five days a week. You know, we know the, the screen time could be a challenge, but we're confident that the structure, even when you're at home of that schedule every day, will help a majority of our students. Again, Bob Clark here for the high school, and, and the only thing that I would add to that is that uh, this was a philosophical decision that we made in the in the summer um, to make sure that we weren't taking opportunities away from students. Um, so our, our model remains the same, and um, students will be attending synchronous um, classes five days a week. Thank you, and, and just as a follow-up, um, with regard to our K through five um, friends, um, can you show us or tell us a little bit more about what the the day is going to look like in terms of will there be breaks um what 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 could specials look like for for the students in those grade bands i'll start meredith that's okay good evening everybody ryan charno proud principal of jefferson avenue virtual specials will certainly be a part of the the five-day program we know that special area classes are vital into creating well-rounded and balanced individuals, and we know that that needs to continue in the virtual setting as well. We also know that special area classes provide a nice break to the core academic uh, day in a schedule, so we certainly know that that's gonna be even more valuable as we transition to five days. The, the who and uh, the when and the schedule of who will be teaching those classes, that is the, the, the work that all building leaders at all elementary buildings will be working on at this point as we look at scheduling uh, and the logistics of teacher assignments for that. But certainly we will create a schedule so that every virtual class will have a schedule each of the five days. And we know that our special area teachers, we're confident and they are ready. They cannot wait for the increased contact with students both virtually as well as in person and uh, we know that the value that they play in the day for our students is uh, really important so it will be a part of the virtual program and Meredith do you want to talk a little about what that virtual program schedule might look like in the other areas yeah that sounds great thanks Ryan uh, in general uh, the virtual program so far uh, while being two and a half days in general for most of the year uh, has has not been a full day for our K-5 students. So I think there's a little bit of a misnomer that kids are on at the elementary level, you know, right from the start of the day through the end of the day. Our teachers have been fantastic, as Aaron said earlier, uh, at finding ways to balance both the academic 
times along with you know community building opportunities a little bit of fun in there of course time for play time for breaks time for lunch and specials and all those things that are important whether you're in person or virtual the way I like to explain it is with the five day a week virtual program, we're increasing the number of hours that a child will be on a screen and engaged with their teacher over the course of the week, but we won't be increasing it over the course of a day. If anything, I might predict that the day might have a little um, less Con, you know, on the screen time straight in a row. So if I have my two cohorts together and we have five days, as a teacher now, I might have the flexibility to do some whole group instruction, allow t the students to go off and do um, some independent pieces while I'm working with small groups and bring them back and forth. So I think what you'll find is a nice balance of more time consistently over the course of the week while not making any single day overwhelming. Again, the younger the students, K2, looking to still build in plenty of breaks, uh, the things that Deb referred to earlier, the mindfulness, the community building, the play, the things that our district stands for. Dave Dunn again at the middle school. And, uh, Good news is for all of you parents in the community, you're going to get another schedule. And that schedule, at least at the middle school, is going to be a day one, day two. So that'll be your lifeline for the rest of the year. That'll kind of walk you through. Good news also is our, our phys ed teachers will see the kids twice a week now, actually uh, two and a half times, twice one week and three times the next week, as opposed to just one day a week. So there are some benefits to coming back in terms of our special areas. They're just going to have more contact. Uh, but the special area schedules won't change at all. How they're seeing their teachers now will be the same, only just with more frequency. Uh, we'll also pretty much have the kids uh, math, science, English, social studies, foreign language. So they're going to be cameraing in uh, a minimum of five, five periods a day. And then, of course, we don't build in a lunch, so that's going to be a break time for them. Uh, study hall will be a break time for them. And if they have like lit lab or lab, uh, math lab or any kind of special education supports, uh, that'll, that won't change either. That'll be the same, only just with more frequency. So there will be some breaks during the course of the day. But truth be told, I mean, it is going to be, I'm going to say at least five, six periods a day in which the all virtual students will actually be, be engaged within their classrooms. Uh, so just speaking for this high school, um, very similar to the middle school in the sense that the schedule has built-in breaks. You know, most of our students will have a PE, study hall, um, lunch, some kind of combination of that on a daily basis. So um, while we, we recognize there'll be an increase in the number of the frequency of the days, um, right now they're either on a two, week, two days a week or three days a week with the, the way that we've been rotating Wednesdays. Um, that will increase um, to five days. But again, there are some natural breaks in there. And, and like Dave said, uh, encouraged by the fact they'll be getting more PE. Um, so we strongly encourage parents to take advantage of those opportunities to get outside and to, and to be active. Great. Thank you so much for that clarification. We appreciate it. Um, now talking a little bit about health and safety and actually breaks of a different kind. Um, we have students who will be in the building and with more density in classrooms in different areas. Um, so the question came up about what is the plan to give students safe mask breaks if they're only three feet apart in the classroom? Yeah, so our masking protocols need to remain in place, uh, especially due to the reduced social distancing and also despite vaccination. So when possible, masking breaks should take place at natural breaks in the day as well as outside. Um, if elementary students are to have snack in the classroom, then snack um, should be brief, to, you know, kept to kind of like five to seven minute breaks, encouraging um, teachers to organize that in a manner where they may take their break in every other row and then having a second stage of breaks for a uh, snack for the other kids so that all students in the classroom aren't unmasked all at once. Um, we would encourage parents to make sure that when you're thinking about packing snack that it is an easily consumed snack. And then currently our protocol for secondary students is a really brief three minute or so break on an as needed basis. And again, if if teachers felt like either due to heat or whatever that the classroom needed to have a break, we would encourage alternating rows as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, talking a little bit more about um, sanitizing and cleaning, um, we, we do have with us this evening Aaron Smith, our Director of Facilities. Thank you for being here, Aaron. So we have a few questions for you. And the first one is about what, what is the plan to 
uh, clean and sanitize high surface areas such as desks, doorknobs, tables, stair railings, uh, buses. I know that uh, Dr. Lawrence is here so he can uh, address that perhaps at some point as well. Yep. Um, but those, those kinds of high traffic areas, if you will. Right. So currently, um, activities in our building look differently than they, than they have in the past. So whereas staff may have normally been setting up for um, assemblies or other activities throughout the building, we've reassigned people and adjusted shifts to bring, you know, sometimes they're, we'll call them a split shift, who might have been on the second shift originally, to actually go make frequent rounds throughout the building, uh, disinfecting those high, high touch uh, point areas. So it's, it's an it's a ongoing thing all day long, any, anytime students and staff are in the buildings. Okay. And also, uh, I know that you've spoken to some other groups about this. Could you talk a little bit um, about the ventilation systems in the buildings? Please? Yeah. So I could really, I could drill down into all kinds of boring details. So I'm going to try to paraphrase this in some sort of discernible fashion. Um, one thing that's a, a hot topic, people will talk, what, what level of filtration are we using? Uh, we, we're MERV 13 level air filtration. That is what we're using through the through the district. So that's that's a that's a key point. Um, we receive the um, airflow and air exchange standards from ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. They're the ones that set the, the airflow standards and how many cubic feet of air a minute and, and air, how 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 we achieve those standards. Um, we, we we meet all of their marks. And all kinds. So it's it, it, in the worst of circumstances, we have a minimum, an absolute bare minimum of one full air exchange an hour, and that would be if it's zero outside. Whereas it's on average, it's probably more in the three to four range when it's 50, 60, 70 degrees outside, and even a maximum of seven or eight air exchanges in an hour if if it's perfect weather outside, and we can we can really take advantage of that without compromising. Uh, the, the, the health and well-being and the comfort of our staff and students. Okay. There was also one additional question, Aaron, about um, the district using barriers of any sort. Um, if you could comment on that of what we've done to this point for safety reasons and why we would or would not do that moving forward in certain instances, Be please. Before I let him jump into that, I just want to preface that. I mean, that's been a big topic of conversation learned a lot about barriers. Um, I also learned that, you know, there's no research that substantiates their effectiveness. Um, it's all about air flow and ventilation, as Mr. Smith was just saying. So, um, you know, we do have barriers in our district. Um, you know, we have put them in strategic spots, um, and that's okay. But at the end of the day, when we aerosolize, um, you know, it has a, the, the prospects of going around or underneath or, you know, right. the barriers. So, right. um, again, the research on Barriers has um, not proven to be effective. Um, call centers have barriers, and we know that you know that's a source of active spread. We've learned that through the COVID process. So, um, you know, you, you can add to that, but at the end of the day, you know, um, right. we do have barriers, but we don't see that as a highly effective mitigation tool. Okay. I really can't add much more than what Brett said, other than. I get we we focused on areas we strategically focused on areas where we call close contact and personal interaction areas uh, main offices uh, where there's person to person contact where we're exchanging papers and um, us usually where it's uh, kind of interaction for the, with the public or people that are more transient in nature so because we have less control over that environment because because of the way people move around so that that's that was why we were strategic in that I mean we do have barriers to deploy strategically mm -hmm. But again, it's, yeah, those it's barriers very, are again t to the ceiling, to the desk, and you know, again, that's more of a, a wall than a barrier. Right, right. I mean, barrier, you know, the, the what we're talking about is right. that you can look over it and get around it and right. through it. So, good. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. Um, we have a couple uh, questions for Dr. Lawrence with regard to transportation. Can. So one of the burning questions, Dr. Lawrence, is when and how. Will we, as families, indicate our preferences for busing or transporting our children? Thanks, Kevin. So Dan Koistick and Diane Griffith from our Instructional Support Center have really done a great job creating a final decision form that will be sent to parents in the near future to make your final determination of full-time in-person 
or full-time virtual programming. Here, parents will also have the opportunity to identify their preference for transportation. So I really encourage you to fill the forms out as soon as you can. That'll help us with our routing as we are in a little bit of a time crunch. And earlier, there, there was a, a reference in one of the questions about uh, the idea of um, ensuring the, the, the sanitization of the buses. So can you talk a little bit about um, how that's going to look in terms of the routes and when that happens? Sure. So we've had uh, a lot of success this year with cleaning the buses. The bus drivers, attendants, mechanics have done a great job. The buses are wiped down after the runs. Uh, they get a uh, disinfection. Um, usually on Wednesdays, but they're sanitized daily, multiple times. Um, high touch areas like handrails, tops of the seats are wiped down um, in between the routes. Okay. And then and this question uh, was one that we had this afternoon and sort of spills over into the buildings. And I know each building might be a little unique with this, but um, with a higher number of folks, students coming back into school, um, the, there is a little bit of um, anxiety over the, the drop-off and the pickup scenario. So um, we're wondering what that could look like, if it's going to be different in terms of that and times and staggering that or um, how that flow could look. We know that that's um, not the prettiest and the, being frank and honest, um, but it is what it is. And um, I think we're just looking for a little bit more clarification on that if we could. Sure. So our buildings, you know, all the school buildings have done a great job coming up with plans to address safe drop off and pick up at the schools. Uh, we encourage parents to utilize the bus if they feel comfortable. Um, and if they do not, because we're going to have traffic issues, the more parents that we have dropping off at schools, each school building will come up with a set schedule. And we ask parents to really pay attention to that. Arriving early only ends up blocking the traffic flow. So if they say be here at 2 o'clock, if you can be there at 2 o'clock, traffic will flow. If we have people getting there at 1.30, 1 o'clock, even though you might have time, it just creates a backup and uh, a form of gridlock. So if we can work with the schools, especially if you're driving, that is much appreciated. Great. Thank you. Thank I don't you. know if anybody else has anything to add to that from the building level. If not, that's fine. I think I can speak for all of us uh, except to say that we'd love to have you on the bus if possible. You know, we're looking at doubling the potential number of cars coming into our parking lot, and uh, you're talking about in excess of 300 cars. Uh, we have a one way in, one way out, and the only the only staggering time we have is really the buses are coming to us within a 10 minute band, and we have no control over that because they've got to get to another school. So the only thing we can stagger is when parents are allowed to come in. And with 300 cars, uh, I could easily have parents here coming in a half an hour later just to get their car, their kids, because we just won't be have the capacity to allow that many cars in at one time. So if you feel comfortable, I'd love to have you have your children on the bus. I think that's always the safest way to get kids to school, and it will certainly help cut down on the traffic congestion within our parking lot, and, and again on Eight Road, uh, coming into our lot as well. Thank you. Can I can I jump in really quick? Um, this idea of bringing everybody back. I mean, it, it is congestion, and I'm going off script, and I'm sorry, but I think it's a nice softball for you guys because um, starting with the secondary where it's mostly congested, right? How are we going to manage the flow? Um, what are we going to do different with our schedules? Um, can you speak to that? Because all of a sudden now, you know, where it was sparse, now we're going to have concentration of students. How are we going to mitigate that? I see that as a question, and I'm going to start with... Mr. Clark, because that's probably our most congested area, then we'll go to the middle schools, and if elementary wants to pick up on that. Sorry, so Kevin. I assume you're talking um, about passing time and, and unstructured settings, that kind of thing as well, right? Correct. We're not just talking transportation, okay? Um, so uh, real quick, um, you know, the passing time issue for, for FHS has been managed really quite effectively with one-way hallways, and uh, we do anticipate that, you know, with twice the density that um, we will have crowded areas, um, but we're confident that the kids um, do a great job of um, aligning themselves when they aren't one way on, on one side of the hallway or the other, and um, that, you know, again, passing time is only, a, you know, a period of five minutes. And it's really only congested for about two minutes of that time. So um, we're confident that we can move through with those existing protocols. 
I'm going to ask um, Mrs. Miles, who, again, who's taken on a lot as being our, our lead COVID agent here here in the district. But uh, about, <laughs> why is everyone laughing? <laughs> it's my new title. <laughs> I don't think that's allowed. But <laughs> can you speak to again? Um, you know, our protocols with masking and the amount of interaction time when why that's important. Absolutely. I, I mean, when we think about kids passing in the hallways, yes, there's going to be twice as many kids, you know, during that, you know, ranges anywhere from three to five minutes, depending on the building, I guess, for passing time. Um, but kids are steadily moving through the hallways. We're going to be looking for, to the best that we can, adult supervision in the classroom doorways to make sure that we're keeping the traffic flowing. Kids will be masked, of course. So that interaction time is going to be very minimal. You know, um, as I said, the definition of exposure, I, I think I had shared earlier today, remains the same, you know, even with these latest changes, you know, from the CDC. So um, exposure is, you know, one or two people unmasked within three feet of each other and um, uh, for as much as 15 minutes or longer in a 24-hour period. So when you think about students passing in the hallways, that is extremely brief contact as they're moving along the hallway. So really low risk in that moment for exposure to a positive case if a asymptomatic carrier is in the building at the time. So you, you couple that and you compare that to like wrestling, right? Sure. <laughs> and we, we won't get into that, but I'm saying to you like, you know, that that's an important factor in this conversation. We understand that the increased you know, density is going to occur. We're going to try to mitigate it with one-way traffic, but I also want to send it now to our middle school friends um, to talk about how we're going to add another layer of mitigation to this. Thanks, Brett. Like, in addition to continuing to talk to students about wearing masks properly and all that, which they've done a fantastic job this year to begin with, but with the excitement of having their friends they may not have seen for a while in there, too, we want to make sure we're reinforcing all the safety precautions we've already had in place. But in addition to that, you know, uh, we're talking about possibly extending a little bit like our passing time so we can stagger some classes so they won't all be in the hallways at the same time, too. Just like for JP, for instance, you know, we don't have that easy way of doing some one-way traffic in there, so we're trying to find other ways to make sure kids aren't all in the halls at the same time. We've been doing a really good job, and again, Dave and I have communicated a lot. You know, our students aren't stopping at lockers a lot. They're moving through the buildings, not congregating in the halls, and we've been really emphasizing getting from point A to point B in the, in the quickest, easiest way possible. So we'll continue to reinforce that, try to stagger sometimes if needed, and uh, so I, we're really appreciative of that, especially that first Wednesday, uh, having off so we can kind of see how it's gone for two days, make sure we're checking ourselves, and if we've got to make some tweaks and improvements, we can do that right then, too. Another nice feature about the middle school, especially in sixth grade, is uh, they pretty much stay within the, the same three or four classrooms most of the day. So they're not traveling except uh, going out to specials. Seventh and eighth grade, almost the same with the team. We got uh, math, English, social studies, all classrooms are all in the same area. So again, there'll be some minimal traveling back and forth, but we do have you know, some, some type of team uh, support that will kind of minimize how many kids are actually traveling. The morning, I got to tell you, parents, your kids are great. They, they come in and go right to class. Uh, some of our teachers are actually starting about 10 minutes earlier because the kids are all ready. <laughs> they're ready to go. So there's no hanging around the hall. They come in off the bus. They go to the locker or not, and they have their stuff in their backpack, which has which really become problematic. Our kids are carrying around 40-pound backpacks. But these kids go right to class. So that's been helpful in the morning, and no surprise, at the end of the day, they're going right out the building, you know, to the buses or cars. So, so I think that brings up another point, and again, I, I'm going to give the elementary a shot at this as well, um, but our students are amazing. I mean, they have answered the call. Um, it's been a different year. It's impacted them significantly, but they come to school, they're focused, um, they're masked, they get it done, and they do follow the rules. And that's a credit to our community. That's a credit to our families. That's a credit to, you know, the reinforcement of the expectations of the, that our staff has done and our administrators have done. But that's all going to have to continue, that reinforcement, that modeling, um, you know. So I, I just want to just give a big shout out to our, to our um, students who have done a great job. But, you know, at the elementary level, you know, it, it gets pretty, it gets pretty um, heavy um, during, you know, um, you know, recess outside. I mean, that adds layers as well. But 
Mr. Charno, want to give it a shot? Yeah, certainly. Uh, Brett, I appreciate it as well. I think our, our students have been resilient and absolutely amazing, so we're thankful for that. Uh, in elementary, we're lucky. We have our classes uh, that typically stay with each other, so we'll continue to do that, keep our classrooms in, in their pods uh, with their classmates. We'll continue as well with the traffic patterns, the safely dif distance traffic patterns throughout our hallways. And then Brett, you mentioned recess time. So currently we have scheduled recess times to decrease and keep densities uh, and the number of students lower on our recess areas. And we will continue to do that even with our greater number of students. So every class will have scheduled recess times, but we'll do it in a way so it's spread out and kids uh, have lower densities outside. And of course we know we're gonna maximize every, every inch of outside space uh, for, for teachers to take students out and use uh, the variety of spaces we have in our outdoor areas. I'm going to throw one more, at, and we'll start with um, elementary um, cafeterias. You know, um, that's such an important part of our day. Again, our food service director is here, uh, Michelle Rav uh, Mersavage, but, you know, I know our principals will be managing that, and while I'm, you know, dragging this out so you can get ready, I don't, again, I'm throwing some curveballs in here. I appreciate it, but I know you, you're, you'll be able to answer this. How are we going to... It's not a curveball. It's actually the next question we were going to talk about. No, I don't read those lists. <laughs> <laughs> you're just, you're not even going off script. It's fun. All right. So cafeterias, the, the good news is this is actually an easy one for us because with the CDC requirements, when they're unmasked, we're still expected to be at six feet. So this is not a change in the sense of we are not concerned about the safety of our students. They'll remain at six feet. Uh, in terms of lunch. But we did need to do some planning in order to make room for all of those extra students. So each of our buildings is a little bit differently um, making this change. Some of our buildings are extending the lunch period by a small amount, starting lunches a little bit earlier or extending them a little bit later. Again, those will be communicated to you, but they're not significant. And their snacks will be at opposite ends of the day, so they'll have you know ample opportunity to not feel hungry. And in other buildings, we've been able to expand further into other spaces that we weren't using for cafeterias. So in terms of cafeterias and lunchtime, we feel really good about the way we're set up at elementary. And Deb already spoke to snack earlier. I think she said it, but I'll just reiterate it. Snack, now that we're getting towards springtime, we'll encourage it to be outside as much as possible. But we do have some indoor plans in order to keep that six feet distance for short periods of unmasking. See how I made that nice and easy for you? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Pecro or Dave? Uh, yeah, I got it. Thanks. Meredith answered that very well. You know, same thing. We're going to continue with our current setup uh, for kids and just finding some alternate locations uh, for the new students that will be coming in when we're doubling up here. That will include possibly using some outside space when we can, uh, classrooms so they're spaced apart, like Meredith said, so they can be masked but be safe safely distanced so they can enjoy their lunch. So, and we'll communicate that home with parents. Once we, once the survey comes in, we know our numbers that we're dealing with, where we can sit them safely and where they'll be. So we'll communicate that home as soon as we have all that info. Yeah, Dominic, Tom Monticelli here again, proud principal of Minerva Deland. Lunches is gonna be an easy one for us. You know, I've been overly cautious about lunches. So I actually had them at seven feet for the first, uh, portion of the year so we're going to bump that down to six feet but same thing <laughs> don't don't tell the kids though um, they're going to be at six feet and we're using hallway space we're using we have a large group uh, we have a large instruction room right next to our cafeteria so we're going to be repurposing that space a little more hallway space and our staff and students have done a great job of revitalizing our courtyard so on nice days we'll be outside but we have repurposing staff as well to monitor but as we've all said, our students are fantastic. They are going to respond well to this. So I'll just wrap things up. The, the unique piece um, for us, which also makes it easy, is that our seniors go out to lunch um, for senior privilege. And um, with the, between the three cafeterias we have, we also expanded into a quarter of the gym. Um, and so our plan would be to expand further into the gym if need be. Um, our, our partners in the PE department and our um, athletic director have been amazing in accommodating us. It's good preparation for us as we'll be uh, without a cafeteria next year and so um, we'll be using the gym space for an entire year so our kids have adapted to it really well and we have plenty of space and you're alluding to the capital project alluding to the capital project we're very excited to ha one day have a very brand new cafeteria that's so another meeting though. just a little bit of patience on that thank you um i know mr trench is going to do another question but i'm just going to do a quick time check it's uh 7 um we have approximately 10 more minutes 
Um, we're we're going to honor that time frame for our listeners and for mm -hmm. our participants here. Sorry, Mr. Andrew. No problem. Thank you. So very briefly, um, we talked about you know how we're going to distance for certain um, unstructured things. Um, we know for physical education, we can we can create that, especially if we're outside and doing certain things. Can you briefly comment um, on the ensemble situation in terms of band and choir and what that could look like? I'll go ahead and start, and then I'll just ask the administrators to jump in. But we have been operating our PE classes and our ensembles that have been in place at 12 feet of distancing. So with the reduced distancing, we'll be going to six feet, but no closer for those um, activities. PE, of course, ideally, and we know what our springs are like in Rochester, but ideally they'll be outdoors on those beautiful days and you know taking advantage of the fresh air and the distance out there on the fields. Um, and then I know that Pam Sarani is our uh, director of special programs and overseas music program, and she's working with our instructors about um, the appropriate modified mask to um, wear with their instruments um, as we get closer together. Great. Thank you. At the middle school, I've talked with our music instrumental teachers, and we're going to be able to bring both cohorts together, and we've got the spaces large enough. So we're not anticipating a problem with ensembles. I will just give you a visual, though. Imagine a large auditorium with Dave Yusko, 68 kids. They are actually in every corner uh, behind the stage as well as in front of the stage. It's like surround sound because Dave's like almost in the middle conducting. <laughs> but we're actually using spaces on the stage as well, as well as the auditorium seats. But to my knowledge, we're going to be able to fit all of our ensembles uh, when they all come back together. Uh, for Minerva Deland, same, I would echo all the pieces that have already been said. We have a, a large auditorium for our class size, so we're going to be able to do that safely and effectively. I guess the only thing that I would add is um, really the big piece of this has been lacking throughout the year is the ability to perform. And um, the teachers have been amazing advocates and extremely creative in trying to come up with alternatives. We're working with our partners in the Parenton, um, you know, town um, um, you know, organization to potentially do outside um, concerts or, or outside concerts here on the grounds. And um, that I'll be looking for information on that very soon, and a, as well as a musical um, performance outside. So they're, they're doing everything they can within the guidelines to give our kids opportunities to perform. Great. Thank you. So we're going to have time for one more question, then I have one to sort of round it out for Brett at the end. Um, you we, can't throw me any curveballs. Well, no, hey, we plan that. you threw curveballs here? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So we know that um, you know, we want to be reasonable with our students when, when they come back and make them you know, hopefully feel comfortable and, and be reasonable about what we're expecting from them in terms of assignments and, and other things. Um, but we do have some families that are, are very curious to know at the end of the year, how will I know where my child is faring in terms of their academic progress? So to that end, um, I'm asking the question of what are some measures or some, some things that, that, are, that, that you're using or thinking about using within your buildings to help report out to parents um, the successes and the, the things to celebrate in terms of the growth of their, their children as well as some things that they can look forward to in the future is maybe some growth areas. So at elementary, our teachers have been measuring students' progress since, since September using a variety of assessment tools. Um, twice already this year, we've given all students universal screenings in the areas of ELA and math using the NWA map assessment, and we will do that a third time as well. Teachers are frequently assessing students' reading levels, sight words, phonological awareness skills, um, using our new math expressions curriculum this year, there are common assessments that are given at the end of um, units. So all of that data helps us measure where students are, and we will continue to do that through the end of the school year and report that progress to parents where students are doing well um, and where we see areas um, you know, that need to be strengthened. In addition, it's, I think, important just to share out to our elementary parents that at this point in time, New York State is requiring the administration of the three through eight assessments, um, grades through three eight assessments in the areas of ELA and math, and then in the area of science for fourth grade students. They have given our building some flexibility in the administration of those assessments, giving us a two-week window to offer those tests to students. 
And important to note that they have reduced the testing duration down to one day. So it would be one day for ELA, one day for math, and then for our grade four students, just one day um, of a science written assessment. And parents can look for more information coming from um, their child's building regarding the actual assessment dates. ELA is gonna be administered in April, and the math test is administered in May, and science for fourth graders is administered in early June. And I know this, uh, this is Dave Dunnigan at Martha Brown. I know several parents are asking, you know, what kind of feedback are they going to get? Um, you know, since last March, uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, it's not been uh, friendly to staff, students, or families. And uh, those families out there, you know, only you know how much you've really had to struggle since last March. You know, we still say, you know, Maslow over Bloom. We still have families wondering about basic needs, you know, food, water, and shelter, e even a year later after this pandemic. And of course, for the first uh, almost 25 to 30 weeks, our uh, learning platform has been pretty pretty unevenly accepted by students. Uh, some kids are struggling. Some kids have been struggling since last March. So to put a typical final exam in front of them, I think would be highly unfair and really um, not really a true caliber of trying to assess kids where they're at. You know, we'll have our lead teachers from both middle schools talk about this issue and find out exactly how they want to do some assessments, talking about perhaps either um, authentic based projects. I know we've got the NWEA, which we will be doing to give us kind of a nationally normed uh, reference test for the kids. So that's probably going to be our best method to report back to parents at the end of the year in terms of the NWEA or the map that we use twice a year anyway. Okay, you want to add? No, I think you did a great job of that, Dave, too, you know, and that's why, you know, our, we want to make sure that social emotional support's there for the kids as we're coming back and ease in, get them used to that homework and things like that. But as far as those final assessments at NWEA is going to be a good, true indicator, and we're going to make sure we can share that out with all families at the end of the year. Yeah, Don Monticelli here from Minerva Delan. Uh, again, just echo what's already been said. You know, our teachers have been, you know, measuring student learning with standards-based, curriculum-based measures all year. So you, their report card, grades, and comments and feedback from your teachers is going to be your most authentic measurement of where they are. Uh, we, we're also using in Minerva Delan IXL, which you might be familiar with from the middle schools. It's a way to practice learning and, and measure learning. Students can measure their own learning for that matter. We're still developing that at Minerva Delan, so it's not the end all be all at this point, but we're happy to have it. And again, we have potential Regents exam at the end of the year. There's four exams, three of those touch on ninth grade, um, but that's going to be developed in the process here of the next few weeks, whether those happen or not and what the requirements are going to be. But we're going to take, as always, the student-centered approach and focus on what's best for our kids and to take care of them, but also ha hold them you know, to, to important standards of instructional uh, standards-based measures, but doing so with uh, you know, putting students first. Again, there's a bit of a continuum at the high school in the sense that um, AP exams are are definitely happening um, in uh, May and into uh, early June. Um, we still have, as Mr. Monticelli said, uh, a few Regents exams less, left to account for. Um, we're going to start by uh, working with teachers collaboratively to talk to them about um, where they're at and um, how they'd like to bring um, things to a close. But as we emphasized earlier in the year, um, in terms of the pace of instruction and the scope and sequence of what they're learning, um, we're not anticipating adding to that. Um, we, we really need to foster um, strong uh, connections with the kids, and we're going to take that opportunity to do so. But at the same time, we want to prepare them for the assessments they've signed up for. Uh, many of our students are looking forward to, to that opportunity. And uh, again, the, the things that we develop locally will be based on what they actually had time to learn and uh, will be thoughtful and, and reasonable um, um, depending on the situation as we develop that. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time this evening. We're, we're getting close to the end of that. I'm going to turn it back over to Brett. And wondering, Brett, in your closing remarks, um, there was uh, the questions that come up several times about um, what will happen if we do not receive approval from the New York State Department of Health in terms of the transition back to full-time on the 19th. So if you could address that, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. We know for the past year, um, Dave, you said it perfectly, you know, there's been COVID, the health issue, and we've experienced that on many different levels. <clears throat> you said it perfectly when you said, our educational program has been unevenly accepted by students and families, it's been a hardship. Our educators have magnificently pivoted 
never going to use that word again once I get out of COVID. They have reinvented how they deliver instruction with so much class style and pride in representing. You said it perfectly, severe dysregulation. We know that our students have experienced adverse childhood experiences in ways that we never could have imagined. Our staff, our community as well, economic hardship. There's been social unrest, and we haven't had the opportunity to consistently process it with them in a constructive and meaningful way. But you know what? There's good news. There's good news, right? There's a vaccination. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. There's knowledge of the disease process Mitigation strategies that we know that are effective, our schools have been proven to be safe, we mask. We have in-house testing. We contact trace. Thankfully, even in the middle of a spike, and we are in the middle of a spike, right, it, it appears that our health care systems are sustaining it. That's because of all the great work and community efforts. The district is going to continue to plan to be in school full-time on April 19th. Whatever's happening at the state level, it counts, right? Um, hopefully they'll be able to get their house in order, but we're getting our house organized and in order so we can prepare to be the best for our students and our community. And, and with that, um, that is how we need to look at this. Um, you know, we're always hearing that they're gonna adapt the CDC guidance. They're gonna make some modifications. Well, that's good but we're planning and our expectation is the, on the 19th. Now, if somebody comes out and says no, we'll have to deal with that. But um, I'm really proud of this effort. I'm proud to be sitting up here with all of you. Um, the passion, level of expertise and command you have of our schools and love that you have. And I know that our staff, if they could all fit here, they would be here as well. Um, I'm proud to be with all of you and I'm going to end as I, have for the past several months. This is about you know, building resilience. Our students don't need a t-shirt anymore. They've lived it. Our community doesn't need that as well because they're living it. But it's time to come back and come together as a community and unite around this effort. It's not gonna be perfect. But the same principles, grace, patience, and understanding and building each other up, learning from each other, leaning on each other, and, and we'll be back doing what we do best. So um, I know our Board of Education has high expectations for this process, and they'll be talking more about this in the near future. And with that, um, I'm going to be signing off. Um, heartfelt appreciation to those who have um, um, visited with us here tonight, and of course um, to um, the administrative team here who um, dedicated multiple evenings to be a part of this process for the betterment um, of our school community and most importantly to serve our students. Thank you all. Have a good night.